Okay, um, what I wanted to talk about today was sparked off by a couple of phrases that appeared in the introduction to today's session. Um, I commend Terry O'Connor with coming up with the phrase humming with crossfire and short on cover because it could be said to aptly describe the 1998 conference that today is based on. Um, I was there and I witnessed the arrows flying between two camps of people. On the one hand, there were those who were saying that uh, environmental archaeologists are too data-driven. We start from the data and we work out from there. Hence, we are rich on data, but still short on theory and epistemology. On the other hand, there were those who were saying that theoretical archaeology is too pie in the sky, too concerned with aspects of life that we can't hope to see in the data. Or can't we? Well, it looks like the presentations today have a slightly different flavour to them. Um, they've slightly got a slightly broader perspective on how we interpret data. Now, I say we, but most of the people presenting today are university researchers. Um, so, what about environmental archaeology um, in commercial archaeology? Well, I'd say that a, um, a discussion session of a report written today would look rather like one written in 1998. Um, now, that's not to say that nothing has changed. Plenty has changed in that time. We've seen the, um, the certain sub-disciplines have risen in, port in importance, like geoarchaeology and palynology. Uh, we're better at um, using different types of radiocarbon dating, although we're still not good enough. And also, regional uh, research frameworks have emerged in that time, and uh, which underpin our work, and I'll mention those later. Um, now, what I would say <laughs> is that um, certain theoretical terms probably don't appear very much in the reports, like epistemology, engulfing theory, theory and, and others. So does that mean that we're, we're somewhat conservative? Yes, OK, we've sort of improved on methodologies, but change is somewhat slow. Um, so in commercial archaeology, why is this? Now, um, I don't wish to draw distinctions between commercial archaeology and academic archaeology to reinforce divisions, more it's meant to be helpful and stimulate debate. I, I assume if you are working on a university research, it's, it's quite focused, although you might tell me different. Um, whereas those who are working on developer-funded projects would probably say that they are expected to be more generalist. Now, I work for a small to medium archaeology unit, and we have six field officers who run, run field work. And... Um, at any one time, they probably have about five projects on the go. So we're all juggling projects. We've all got to cover all sorts of different periods, all sorts of um, subjects. But nonetheless, the specialists, the finds people, the archaeobotanist or whatever, <coughs> have to provide reports for all those six people. So I feel that we're just that little bit more stretched across different data sets. We're juggling to that, you know, sort of slightly more nth degree and it has occurred to me that our work programs are therefore becoming rather fraction you know uh, fractionated and um, so we don't get that much opportunity to really burrow into the data and sort of critically think about how we're interpreting data I um, one day uh, not so long ago I found I was in discussions about Mesolithic to early Neolithic stone lined pits and radiocarbon dating. And then we went, uh, that was after two hours, we sort of started talking about another site where there's a medieval heart and building that's somewhat unusual. Um, and then someone popped their head through the door and said, What are you doing about the contents of that Bronze Age cremation? And I said, Oh, yes, okay, just a minute. Um, and then there's some animal bone that needs to be sent off to a specialist. So it's a bit like that. We're sort of flitting to and fro between different projects. Moreover, 
we may get the opportunity to pull together the um, scientific evidence, uh, the botanical remains, uh, the archaeology, some geoarchaeology, and do an overview. But as was said in the 1998 conference, one of the papers, it's actually rarely us that are pulling together the artifactual, the scientific evidence, and the whole holes in the ground. And that's true, whichever sector you work in. But overwhelmingly, um, I, I think what has the biggest impact is that if we're working on developer-funded projects, we are mostly seen as data collectors and data organisers. And it usually works that the projects are costed up with the assumption that we have a working knowledge of the archaeology. And it doesn't leave much wriggle room for research apart from in the project bigger projects. And even then, um, it often feels rather limited. So, what do we do? Well, if you want to make more of it, <laughs> there is one option. We can always disappear down the pub and carry on the analysis there, which does tend to happen, <laughs> I must admit. This chap here, Richard, has been reading some journal articles, and he's been setting the world to rights based on what he's read. But also, we as individuals bring our own specialist interests and also even interests um, for our spare time interests, and that can kind of spark off ideas and different perspectives on what we see daily in the field or through the microscope, in, in my um, case. Um, it doesn't seem like such a, a, a bad way of doing things in some way. And on one project, it's being formalised. Uh, that's a 100 Minories Project London, where uh, they've set up a series of drinking symposia, uh, where they invite the people on the project to come along to these meetings in the evenings, and they also invite specialists to come along and talk about their specialist areas. It might, might be post-medieval clay pipes or something else. Um, so this is a larger project, and so I suppose it's easier to actually get something like this organised. Now, this is not to say that I'm, I'm suggesting that alcohol-fueled uh, interpretation is the way to go. <laughs> now, if I was to send around a survey right now and ask you, do you think anything needs to change? Well, what would you say? Would you say, it's OK, no system is perfect, or B, it needs tweaking? or C, it needs a complete overhaul. Now you might think that I'm painting a rather disappointing picture, but there is always the other side of the coin, and that is that we are working in a sector that provides big data. Over the years, we've this has grown, and it's, it's actually a product of the way that our system works. So what is this system? If you're not familiar with it, it usually starts with the developer who puts together a planning application. The curator, who's the county archaeologist or the um, archaeologist, archaeology planner or similar, considers that and works out what needs to be done with that site. And it's, um, they make good use of the Historic Environment Record or the HER. And they do, and research frameworks also feed into this. They then write a brief for the work that the archaeological contractor must do. And the products of this are firstly a fieldwork report, which once done gets fed back into the HER, and that's critical for informing future work. Now the HER is a far more sophisticated tool now than it was in 1998. You also have the material archive, which goes usually to a local museum. And all the time, this wheel is turning, and we're amassing more and more data year after year. So this is the research, the big data and the big stuff. Now, our problem has been that only a small percentage of sites usually get published, and they're freely available. And so what you end up with is a big cloud of grey <coughs> literature, which is the unpublished archive report. Now, it's, it, this is a resource that's freely available to all, all professional archaeologists, whatever sector, and the public. And it's always been available in the HERs, usually free for researchers 
for a fee for commercial archaeologists. And making it available online has actually risen, made the, you know, risen the profile somewhat. You can access it through ADS data, uh, archaeology data service, Grey Literature Library, which is uploaded by the archaeologists and commercial archaeologists, or Heritage Gateway, which is uploaded by HERs and national records. There are still problems with comprehensiveness and signposting through the grey literature, particularly with pulling out environmental data from that cloud. I don't want to concern myself with this right now. I'm more concerned with asking who's using it, for what purpose, and um, what are we doing with it, and are we just mindlessly adding to this data cloud? Well, we do get the opportunity, if I consider those working in commercial archaeology to step off the merry-go-round every now and again. There are some funds that we can access. Here in England, uh, a, a large part of it comes from historic England, was English heritage. And that enables us to reassess that data and work out how best to manage the archaeological resource. Um, for instance, aggregate levy funding has helped us uh, to improve the way that we excavate on gravel quarries or others. Predictive tools have come about. Uh, this is one of mine, a toolkit for rapid assessment of small wetland sites. Um, and I've used volunteers here to help with ground truthing regional frameworks as well, they all feed into this process. Um, also there have been some uh, university-led projects which use commercial data. Two here, uh, Roman Rural Settlement Project is using all published and unpublished data for England and now it's moving into Wales. This is a big data mining project. On the other hand, uh, we have the PLOS Pathogens project, which used archived human bone and looked at the pathogen that transmitted Black Death and its movement through Europe. It did use, for instance, um, human burials from uh, Hereford Cathedral. So there, they're mining the archives, and the archives are also really important. They're fast becoming a hot potato because constantly we are stuffing the museums full to the gunnels every year and there's been a lot of talk about well what's happening to this what are we doing with it what's going in well largely it appears to be material from uh, developer-led projects there's a small gr growing amount of material coming in from community projects but what's coming out who's dusting off the boxes and lifting the lids well, that's open to questions, and there's been a lot of discussion about um, how best to use this material. I put a sign on there that says open question mark, because quite a few of the museums have actually closed in that they're not accepting any more material, and it's either because they're too full or they're under-resourced, staff-wise. Um, so it's quite clear that we are underusing the resource and we actually need to use it in order to justify keeping these museums open and resourced. If we lift the <coughs> lid of the boxes, I've just put up a few suggestions of some of projects that you could do with the data. It could range from the practical, uh, using older material and improving radiocarbon dating for um, for key <laughs> projects and English heritage are very involved in, with this and there's all sorts of material from uh, small underfunded sites that you know could do with actually being drawn together but maybe it could also be used for testing theories coming back to what I started with. Well what I'm coming to I suppose is what we really could do with is cross-sector working in order to make the best use of the resource so there are you know various sectors that people work in and um, we need more arrows flying about between those people because all these different people have different perspectives on the data someone from a university team might have completely different ideas as to what could be pulled out of the museums than what 
we do, the people who are usually putting the material in museums. And therefore, you know, if that's the case, it needs to be said. Okay.